Hi, I'm Jim Miraj, and today we're going to visit Susan Postal, both here at the Quaker Meeting House in Rye, New York, and at her home. Susan is a Zen priest who heads the Meeting House Zen Group, which shares this old church with the Quakers. Well, here at the Meeting House, which as you all know is a Quaker uh, meeting house that's used every Sunday for Quaker meeting for worship, um, the Zen group meets twice a week and we meet primarily for Zazen, the seated formal meditation on the cushions here. Um, and that's really the core of our practice is this strong silent sitting together. We support each other. If we sit alone at home, most of us find it gets a little bit thin, but here somehow we give a, um, a rather subtle but very powerful support to our practice to, that we, we share with each other. Um, there's other ways that we also practice here. Uh, in between the 30-minute periods of Zazen, we do a, a formal walking meditation, which gives us a chance to bring our, um, our, our concentrated attention off of the cushion and into our arms and legs. You know, the aim of this practice is not to spend our lives sitting on a cushion. So I find the walking meditation a wonderful kind of halfway into real life uh, practice, a chance to practice um, letting awareness be full and complete with each step. So we have the walking um, and the sitting. Uh, we also do some chanting practice every evening when we meet. Uh, usually towards the end. Um, chanting is a new, a new experience for most uh, Westerners. Uh, and some people have a lot of difficulty chanting in uh, Sanskrit or Japanese or transliterated Chinese, Japanese, and they much prefer the English. Um, my late teacher, Maureen, uh, made it very clear that the real benefit of chanting is not necessarily the meaning of what is being chanted, but becoming the sound itself. So um, she really emphasized in her zendo chanting as voice zazen, voiced meditation, becoming one with the sound uttered and the sound heard. And I hope here that we, um, some of that spirit from uh, Maureen Zendo in Cambridge, um, we try to follow her style of chanting. Uh, she had a um, wonderful, deep, almost we used to call it a baritone voice, very low and very vibrant and alive. And uh, here when we, we do chant, the whole effort is to become the sound, not to worry about what it means. Um, we also, um, most times that we gather have, there's a short presentation of the teachings, a uh, short Dharma talk, uh, which is a little, uh, usually based on a text and some commentary on it, a little more formal, little by little letting people um, hear the teachings that come from the Buddhist tradition, uh, China, Japan. Um, on the intensives, we, there's a longer talk and a, a little more um, in-depth look at what we call the Buddha Dharma or the teachings um, in the Zen tradition. Um, we also sometimes take formal tea together. Um, again, this is something which uh, I learned from Maureen, a way of giving and receiving uh, wonderful fragrant tea uh, as a practice of no giver, no receiver. So when we take tea, it's a very beautiful kind of a simple ceremony of drinking together 
and really drinking this life and this practice together. So we do that for the intensives and once in a while in the evenings too. Uh, sometimes on the all-day sittings, what we call intensives or during retreats, uh, there's a chance for people to meet one-to-one -one, uh, with me and we do that and I do my best to encourage practice. Um, so that is happening, but it doesn't happen uh, at the regular uh, sittings. Of course, I'm available um, if someone wants to talk uh, privately, but generally speaking, the formal, what we call interviews or face-to-face -face meetings uh, take place just on the Saturdays. Um, that's a time where we can go a little deeper and people can expose where they're stuck. And if I'm uh, able, I will do my best to give a little push so that we all can keep going. Essentially, my, my role here is to encourage uh, practice. That's, uh, each of us have to do it for ourselves and by ourselves in a way, but it sure helps having someone uh, give you a gentle, swift kick once in a while and uh, encouragement to keep going. At Susan's home, we learned more about her own inner journey, which is closely connected with her Zen practice. I grew up in Los Angeles, of all places, um, a place which I don't care for now, and I don't think of um, except in memory. I don't think of it as home anymore. I grew up in L.A. My parents were both um, immigrants from Germany and France and had come to this country in the 20s. Um, I guess my, my interest in uh, spiritual matters began very early. I remember, um, and I should say my parents um, were both rebellious. They had both rebelled against their very strict Lutheran European background and uh, were not attending church in this country at all. My father was interested in metaphysics, would go to science of mind things, and my mother was interested in Krishnamurti, and neither of them were churchgoers at all. So I was raised in a kind of very free thinking, uh, but spiritually inclined atmosphere, but not uh, the conventional parish uh, organized religion at all. But when I was very young, maybe. Um, Remembering back to maybe around the age of five or six, um, my mother used to say goodnight, and after she closed the door, I'd get up again, and I'd open the curtains and look out at the stars, and I used to do that every night, and it was a kind of a prayer, though I didn't conceptualize it as prayer. It was just my quiet time, I called it, and I treasured that, and I remember clearly one night where she came back, I heard her coming back in, and I went very quickly to jump back in bed, and I hit my chin on the windowsill. We had this, I had this big windowsill, and I bit my tongue, and the blood just spurted out, and I realized, and she came in, and, and the minute I started to answer her, the blood came pouring out of my mouth, and I, I was like embarrassed, and, and, and I don't know, she said, what were you doing? I was, I was looking at the stars, you know. And, uh, but that stuck in my mind, because somehow it, it uh, I didn't want her to take that from me and say I couldn't do that, you know, just because I, bit my tongue. So that was an early sense of, of uh, seeking quiet and seeking a time alone with what was in some sense the infinite. And it was, I was really very young when that started and I, I think that was sort of a practice that I did for years. Um, I also have a memory of a time looking in the mirror and I must have also been five or six because I had to stand on a stool and looking in the bathroom mirror and um, seeing myself and knowing that that wasn't Susan and that Susan was just a name and I could have been Jane or Mary or something else and that somewhere that question well, who, who am I who what is this and knowing that that who or that what was not the name but something somehow much vaster and bigger than a name um, so those early memories sort of stick when I was about 11 or 12, I wanted to um, start to go to church. I asked my father for a Bible um, for my birthday, and he was rather touched. And then I started going with girlfriends to the local church. 
and got very enthusiastic about. Um, I think it was a Presbyterian church I was going to. Um, then by age 15, I began to find that what was taught there was um, had these boxes around it. Um, you know, we were told, well, if you believe, like, in here you're fine, but anybody that's outside this little box um, isn't saved, so to speak. And I remember asking all these sort of comparative religion questions of the Christian education people at this Presbyterian church, like, what about all the people in China, and what about all the Baha'is, and what about all the... And they kept saying, well, you know, they couldn't deal with that question. And I kept trying to open up, feeling that if there was what we could call God that was infinite and all loving, that people weren't excluded from that loving energy. And it was, you know, if, if God was everywhere and manifesting in all things, then he was completely available to all people. And how could you say you were only saved if you were this kind of person and had this certain system? So I must have been 15, 16 when I became very discouraged by the um, so-called Christian education, I, mean, I can't say so-called, it was Christian education, but it discouraged me. So I left that, and about that time, I was in a wonderful high school in um, Sedona, Arizona. Sedona has now been discovered as a power spot. I didn't know it was about a power spot, I just thought it was wonderful. But the red rocks and the blue sky and open space were very um, encouraging to this kind of solitude that I'd sought as a child. So while I was at this high school, Verde Valley School, which is still in existence, it's a very fine college preparatory, um, co-ed, and unusual school. Um, while I was there, I, you know, um, again found myself a little spot off where nobody knew in a little wash. We had we call them washes. They're like little ravines, and one of the washes behind the girls' dorm, I I buried a. a a coffee can with paper and pencil so I'd always be able to write, write little poems and I made a little flat place where I could sit and I used to go there and sit a kind of prayer and just to be with the sky and the rocks and it was so beautiful there and that was my secret place and nobody knew to this day I wonder if I could still find it if anyone found the can of, of pencils buried there but um, somewhere there was that habit already a kind of a habit of seeking solitude and seeking to have a time just which wasn't social and which wasn't with others, but was just between, as I would put it in those days, between me and God. And that was very important. And being in Sedona was a very good place to have that. So I always feel that my kind of journey in a kind of more um, specific way began in Sedona, where I really began to ask questions and to read a lot. And I went from there to Stanford um, and my freshman year, I really hated it at my freshman year. I ended up feeling I had a good education, but it was so different from being in Sedona in blue jeans to, this was in the late 50s, so I was suddenly in a college where I was told I had to kind of dress up in dresses and skirts and go to fraternity parties and pep rallies and all of this stuff, which isn't what I wanted from college. So I was a little rebellious my first year. Um, and one of my similarly rebellious friends heard that there was this guy named Alan Watts giving a talk on Zen, and so I went my freshman year, I must have been all of 17, in 57, 58, and I heard him speak about this Zen practice, and it was like, it was almost classic light bulb going on, and something inside me said, that's what I've been looking for, or hungering for, and I was so excited to discover, you know, philosophically about Zen, and what it had to say about man's situation, and so I started writing all these papers my freshman year comparing Zen and existentialism. All I could find was D.T. Suzuki, so I read everything that not much had been published in those early days. Um, and I would compare, you know, being in nothingness and Zen and emptiness, and I was really into the sort of philosophical, metaphysical stuff. And my poor freshman year teachers, they, what are you doing? And Western mind can't understand all this. And I was uh, quite convinced otherwise. And um, I didn't keep those old papers, but I know there was life in them because some spark had ignited in me that understood that there was a teaching that was um, about breaking these, these very boxes that had uh, so bothered me in the religious education I'd received and expanding everything into a kind of a, a wide open, um, wide open possibilities. And it was very exciting. 
Um, but I had no idea that there was such a thing as a Zen center or practice. And it turns out Suzuki Roshi was in San Francisco during those years, but I didn't know it. I didn't know people were sitting. I didn't know there was anything you could do about waking up because D.T. Suzuki was very scholarly and he didn't really talk about sitting Zazen much, which is sort of, people have commented since. He had very strong experiences in his youth and he wrote from them, but his vehicle was very much the scholarly one. So I didn't know there was anything to do besides to read and study and write papers. That's, you know, that was what, all I knew of the spiritual life. I tried to sit, after the Alan Watts lecture, I tried to sit Zazen in my dorm room, but of course it was very feeble. Um, so then I tried to reconnect with the church uh, at Stanford, and there was a very nice chaplain there, his name I don't remember now. Uh, but once again, I hit the same walls. It was the same thing, a little more sophisticated. The terminology was a little broader and more um, scholarly. But I felt again I was hitting boundaries, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel completely at home, although I felt moved and called. Um, in some sense by Christianity it didn't there was something still not quite wide enough that was the sense of there was something narrow um, so let's see what happened next um, I was interested in anthropology and I and decided to attend graduate school in anthropology and I think I was really interested in Native American um, religious life and Native American worldview. I had, ever since my Arizona days, been very drawn to uh, American Indian point of view of being one with the whole earth, and there was something in their spirit that drew me. So the only thing I knew at that point was study, so it seemed logical if you want to get close to this point of view, you should study it. So I signed up for a course in um, social anthropology at Harvard, uh, very quickly discovered it was about um, other things like kinship systems and fairly technical stuff. It was possible to uh, look at comparative religion, you know, primitive religions and Native American religion, um, but I found field work very painful. Um, the Indians where I where I visited didn't particularly want to talk to me. They didn't like anthropologists, so I had to pretend to be somebody else. And my whole experience in anthropology was rather uncomfortable. I saw that I didn't like being one. It was an interesting field to study, and I also quickly knew that in order to be successful academically, you had to constantly publish, and to constantly publish meant constant field work, and I didn't like doing field work. I actually hated it because I felt like a stranger who was not wanted, and I had no, I was just like poking around in other people's business, and that was, it bothered me. I didn't like being that. And I just, I think I somewhere at a gut level said, I can't do this for my livelihood. I can't just poke my nose into other people's business where I'm not wanted. And it was actually out of my kind of love and respect for Native Americans that I could not take that role. And uh, I dropped out. I got ended up with a master's degree. I didn't uh, write my dissertation. I took my orals and I have an ABD, I guess they call it. And I'm not sorry I dropped out because I just didn't want to play that game and it's a whole game in academia to uh, keep publishing. And uh, I enjoyed teaching. I taught at Queens College uh, for two semesters, introduction to anthropology, and I had lots of fun with that. And I seemed to have a flair for teaching, so that was you know, good communication. Um, around that time, uh, through some friends that my husband knew, uh, we encountered a um, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And I realized at that time that this was the first time I'd met someone who was practicing and who offered a teaching which wasn't just uh, in books but had to do with uh, transforming one's being and um, becoming, becoming awakened. It wasn't just uh, learning about awakening and that Tibetan teacher, he's a lay Nyingma teacher, Sonam Kazi, was the first uh, sort of uh, master I had encountered in the sense of a realized teacher that I had encountered. Um, and that was in 1969. So from then on became an, uh, a, a new stage of the journey of becoming a practitioner, uh, first of Tibetan Buddhism and then eventually with Zen. 
So that's sort of the background. I first met my Tibetan teacher, Sonam, we called him, um, at a dinner party uh, given by some people who had decided to be his student. I was not one of them. I had decided I wasn't going to do any of this religious stuff. And I had heard that in order to study Tibetan Buddhism, one had to do lots of religious practices. So um, my husband, Paul Postel, had um, become his student and asked me, well, at least come and meet my teacher. So it was really like that to meet his teacher that I went to dinner. And um, I can honestly say that I was not anticipating becoming his student. And in fact, that's what happened by the end of the evening. And it was almost as though, uh, what's the right word? Um, my very skepticism um, was the perfect, uh, the perfect setting for what happened um, because he saw my skepticism and my questions and sort of be that became a vehicle for his teaching and then he um, really be able to drop it and take the next step. Um, I guess we had been talking and I had said something like, well, if I become um, your student, do I have to do all these religious things, these, these chantings and mantras and all this stuff? And do I have to become a Buddhist? And uh, his answer was something like the following. He said, well, do you want realization? And I said, yes, yes, because that was my interest at that point, however we understood that, this waking up. And he said, well, I, I can give it to you. Uh, he said, it's been handed to me by my teacher, and we can pass that on. He said, but it, he said, it's like an egg. It was handed to me in a shell, and the shell is what you're calling Buddhism and all these religious practices. And he said, I can pass it to you, uh, but I must pass it on the way it's been given to me, which is with this, this form that we can call religion. He said, you're asking me to break apart the shell and hand you the yolk. He said, if I try to do that, we'll have egg on the floor, and neither of us will have anything. And that analogy was, again, one of those light bulb things, like, I got it. And I understood for the first time, I think, ever, the, the sense that religious forms are, are like vessels. And they in themselves may not be the truth in, of, in the sense of the teaching but they're vital as containers and that without the container how do we how do we handle at the and pass on and perpetuate over time and that and that's probably true for all religious traditions that they become uh, containers and even though what we're interested in is what is contained uh, we can't just start breaking containers and uh, Sonam liked to talk about eggs. Uh, he also would say, he'd talk about uh, making scrambled eggs. You know, he was very worried that 
in America, people would take a little of the Vajrayana teachings and a little Zen and a little um, uh, Hindu, the transcendental meditation was around then, and take and make some new thing. He said, you'll make like scrambled eggs of this. He said, I don't, you know, that just pained him. And he felt very strongly that if he was going to begin to teach, he wanted to make sure that it would be authentic what he was giving and that it would also be received whole and not bits and pieces or chop suey, he would say. Americans want to make a chop suey, he said. That's not what I'm giving. You know, I'm giving one thing. So somehow at that dinner, uh, when he used the analogy of egg on the floor, uh, there was a whole new... Um, whole new experience for me to meet someone who really embodied a teaching who by very obviously was what had a, a an awakenedness about him and an ability to see where people were and where they were stuck and to to talk speak to that he was just a different sort of person his, his energy was extraordinary and um, at that point I realized I was going to become his student uh, even though I was not drawn to um, Tibetan Buddhist religion, and I didn't know much about it actually, but for some reason I'd heard that it was all this stuff to do. Uh, then I found out about it, and I had a really hard time. It was, uh, we were asked to do a lot of things, like um, count a hundred thousand of um, a certain mantra, we had little beads and we had to keep a little notebook, we actually had to count. You know, you'd go around the beads a hundred, once as a hundred, you'd put a little mark, you'd do it twice, after you did ten, you'd have, you know, a thousand and so forth. And we had to kind of keep score and that was just, it just, it wasn't, it just seemed so external and so silly. And we had to do all this chanting in Sanskrit or Tibetan, uh, neither language I knew, and I was an intelligent, educated, fresh out of Harvard person who wanted to know what I was saying and I was offended that I was to be a parrot and I really had trouble with that. Um, my feeling was if I was going to pray, let me pray so it means something to me and to pray in somebody else's language. So we had arguments about that and I still feel it's important to translate um, but that's you know a separate issue. Um, so I had lots of trouble with what I was asked to do and the first two years we were preparing for an initiation or empowerment ceremony to receive um, more um, what's on them called higher teachings and in order to do that we had to do these five different prayers or mantra a hundred thousand times each and we were also asked to do prostrations making a lifetime vow to do a hundred thousand uh, prostrations vows and um, I was a sort of a skeptic, and um, but I wanted to have the higher teachings, and I wanted to go on. So I remember asking Sonam, "Do I have to have faith in um, all these mantra in order to do this? You know, for have it have any efficacy?" And he said, "No, no, this isn't about faith." He said, "It's about doing it correctly." And then he gave me a wonderful teaching. He said, "It's like soap." You don't have to have faith in the bar of soap in order to wash your hands. But you have to pick it up. If the bar of soap sits there and you look at it, your hands are going to stay dirty. But if you pick it up, turn it on the water, and do the way your mother told you, you know, and you wash the soap, rinse them off, your hands will be clean. It has nothing to do with your faith in the soap. He said, I'm telling you to use these mantra as I'm telling you to do it with visualizations. There were certain things we were to visualize as we're saying them. He said, they will wash you clean. I guarantee you it has nothing to do with whether you believe it will happen or not. And that kind of intrigued me. So being curious, I, uh, I started to count. You know, I got my beads and, I, and it took six months to do um, these five things 100,000 times. And as I got closer to the end of it, and this was just a brief, it's called a nundro, and this was just a brief one that Dujam Rinpoche had designed for busy people in the West. Usually it's much longer form. Um, as I was nearing the, you know, 90,000 or whatever, and the, the numbers were uh, close to completion, something actually I perceived was happening. And it's very strange looking back because I, I still remember sitting upstairs doing this in a kind of dutiful way 
and all of a sudden realizing that something was happening. There was a cleaning, it was a cleansing kind of, uh, a cleansing and a, a purifying somewhere was happening. And I felt as I began to, that last section, as though every time I sat down with the beads, it was like this big shower was turned on and everything was just being washed. All the residues of all the, I don't know, just all this stuff that we accumulate lifetime after lifetime probably was being washed. And it's interesting that Sonam always used that analogy with these practices of the soap and washing. And all of a sudden it was like this huge shower was coming, you know, from up above and just washing. And it was really happening. And I know by the time it was completed and we received the empowerment, I was standing in a very different place than, you know, skeptical Sue at the dinner party who went to meet uh, my husband's teacher. That um, it was clear. I guess what was clear by then was two things. One, that there was a tremendous amount of washing to be done in, in the sense that somewhere I discovered my own density, my own... I don't mean dirt in a bad way, but just all this crud that prevented me from seeing clearly. And one doesn't realize the blockages that are there till one makes the effort to, to wake up. And so somehow during this process, I encountered all the, the obstacles and the hindrances, including my skepticism, which was clearly, you know, you know ego coming up and saying, oh, I know better than this, and you know. So I, I began to be acquainted with, with what we need to do in order to be free at the same time some kind of washing was actually happening so that the two things at that point were clear that there was tremendous work to be done and a kind of taste I guess of a an energy quality which was quite extraordinary and so after two years in this tradition um, I knew for myself that something was possible. At that point, I knew, not because anybody told me or because I read it in a book, but I knew from my own experience that it's possible to, I want to say move forward, but it's, that's, um, that it's, that our being can be affected by practice and that there is such a thing as practice and as, as um, transformation, I guess. And that it was real, and that I could do it in a strange way. There was this, like, and at that point, Sonam was very helpful because he he saw what was happening, and was affirming in such a way that I went forward and uh, really began at that point to be a serious practitioner. Uh, so I thank him. I thank him forever really for having introduced me to my own mind and and possibilities you know without his encouragement I don't know that I would have I don't know who we never know
So I spent about 10 years altogether as a student of uh, Dzogchen, which is um, the great vehicle or the um, teaching of, really teaching of our non-conceptual mind with a capital M. And there came a time, whether it's my own, it's very hard for me to know whether it was my, just my own personal karmic leanings where I felt a need to move into a practice which was less elaborate in outer religious things. And I needed to be in a place where the, the silent sitting was the primary focus. I also needed to work with a teacher who would be a little tougher on me and not just uh, encourage with praise, but push me a little bit. And having uh, read, of course, Alan Watts and Suzuki and others and my original sort of infatuation with Zen when I was all of 17, I sought out um, some kind of Zen setting to continue practicing. And I uh, threw actually through a nice uh, little note from Peter Matheson, who's written um, some beautiful books, among them The Snow Leopard, on his journey. Uh, Peter recommended that I um, look into uh, the Zen community of New York, which was just beginning in Riverdale. This was early 1980. Um, so I did, and I went there really just in my mind looking for a place to sit. I really wasn't looking for a teacher. I'd sort of had an intense relationship with a teacher, and I just wanted to practice. And I felt I had a practice or some notion of what practice was. So I found this little zendo. At that time, it was on a little busy street, Mashalu Avenue in Riverdale. And uh, I found their schedule. And I went in and sat down. And we were told to face the wall. So I faced the wall and sat. And because we faced the wall, I didn't even know who the teacher was. I didn't see who came in. I heard robes rustling. and bells were played and I could smell incense and I went just for the zazen and um, I went for several weeks just sitting and really literally not knowing who, who was there except and I never saw the teacher and then one day I went on a Sunday when there was a Dharma talk and there was this uh, kind of short round Jewish fellow who was the Zen master and he was an American it wasn't a Japanese I didn't know I didn't go there for the teacher. I went there because Peter said that might be a nice zendo to sit in. and I was really completely ignorant. They called him sensei. People had been referring to sensei, but I thought that was a Japanese person. Anyway, so here was Bernie Glassman in his robes, and he began to give a talk. And I was totally astounded because my only experience before had been with a Tibetan and, and other Tibetans, uh, lamas and Rinpoches who were so exotically oriental. And here was someone who, so very New York, uh, although he's from LA, but you know, he'd been from Brooklyn originally, with a shaved head and a robes, speaking the most profound Dharma I had ever heard because it was in English. And so I got it so clearly, I didn't have to strain or figure out. He was speaking about our life and about our own situation right immediately now. And I was absolutely blown away. And I remember coming home thinking, oh my goodness, there's even a teacher in this little place. You know, Not only is it a nice place to practice, but there's somebody who knows something. And I guess I, I take skepticism with me forever because I had gone fairly skeptical. I have a practice and I know something. And I'm 10 years in the Vajrayana, you know. And so I came sort of carrying my bags, you know. And my goodness, here's someone who knows something. And I asked for an appointment to meet with him, I guess, and I remember being very, um, what's the word? Feeling very connected in the heart. I, I say heart meaning heart mind. And sort of meeting with him and coming home and thinking again, oh my goodness, what is this? What is this? And I remember him saying, I hope we can study together. And the way he said the together gave this sense of, of 
heart-to-heart, mind-to-mind connection at the very beginning. And I remember being just astounded and moved and, and, and surprised. I didn't, I didn't go looking for that, and I hadn't expected that. Um, so I became a Zen student, 1980, and found myself working with a teacher uh, with whom there was no nonsense. His role wasn't to pat me on the back and say, very good. His role was to keep, keep encouraging me to keep going, but not to um, sit and admire where I'd been. And I think perhaps that was the the first big lesson um, in the Zen tradition was um, to see rather painfully how all of us, but I can speak only of myself for sure, how I had been hanging on to wonderful spiritual experiences that had happened in the previous 10 years. And I had collected them like a, like a, a row of of monuments or little trophies and I had this collection of opening experiences or wonderful things and I treasured them because they were wonderful and no one had told me that one isn't to treasure and it's automatic anyway and I never been given a teaching about dropping attachment to such wonderful things and I remember Sensei saying um, you've drunk the medicine and you've collected the bottles he said why are you keeping the bottles they're empty and it, you know, it was it was like he had gone with his hand whoosh on the top of that shelf, and they just flew off because they're empty, finished. And the medicine had been drunk, so he wasn't saying this is nothing. He was confirming what was, but it was because it was incorporated in my being, not because of I was holding up these little treasures. You know, I'm saying, look, I've had this, I've had this. And what became so very refreshing for me in the Zen, um, on the Zen path, was that um, was the seeing of our tendency to attach to everything. It's not just that we attach to our habits, um, our impatience, our anger, our things that are bad, you know, that we think we ought to get rid of. That's not only what we attach to. We attach to wonderful things. We attach to our notion of the divine, our notion of the sacred, our notion of heaven or nirvana or Buddha mind or all these wonderful things. We're really stuck on that stuff. And if we begin to have these kind of opening ups of heart mind, then we get even more stuck because I've had this opening and we immediately identify um, to our journey, we identify ourselves with our very journey And so then we have this almost, now looking back, I I laugh. It's almost, it's really sick, you know, because we're trying to wake up, but we, the the ego grabs hold of the, of the journey itself. And it takes a very skillful teacher to notice by the way we talk about it, by the way we are towards what's happening, to point out um, this attachment to, to our awakening. Um... So I I really thank, again, I'm thanking lots of people, but I thank uh, Glassman Sensei, Tetsugun Glassman, for uh, making it very clear that I was hanging on to some wonderful, wonderful uh, openings that were happening, but that that hanging on was a tremendous obstacle. You know, we have this, uh, uh, it's one of my favorite koans of Joshu, a monk comes in and asks old master Joshu, have you eaten breakfast yet? And he says, yes, I have. And he said, well, wash your bowls. And it's like that, you know, we eat breakfast, we, we wake up to some degree, and then we have to wash it out. Otherwise, we're stuck on that breakfast and we're carrying around this old oatmeal all of our lives. And look, I've had breakfast. You know, that's not the point. And that's where we get stuck. And that's, I think, one of the most refreshing, uh, refreshing lessons for me. Over and on, it continues to be a lesson. I think we get stuck forever. Wherever we are, it's possible to get stuck on it. 
So some bowl washing uh, was, in a way, the uh, certainly for me the very important early lessons uh, as Glassman student. We come here twice a week to practice zazen, which is seated meditation. In the Zen tradition, there's a strong emphasis on disciplined, structured sitting practice. Body and mind are not two. How we arrange our body instantly becomes an arrangement of our mind. Sometimes it's said that body, breath, and mind are the three vital components to our life. And so this practice works with all three aspects, body, breath, mind. And we begin by arranging ourselves on our cushion. OK, we place the round cushion at the back of the square cushion so there's room for the knees, and sit on the front third of the cushion. It's important to sit in a posture where the knees can be firmly on the ground. Um, most of us Westerners can't sit in a lotus posture where the feet would be, how do I just demonstrate this, up like this. This would be a half lotus, full lotus would have the other foot up. Most people, when they begin, find this too difficult. So we suggest that you place um, the heels at the center of the body, one foot in front of the other like that. That's called the Burmese position. And have the knees firmly on the ground on the cushion. If that doesn't work, then sitting with a seiza bench or in several cushions piled up are fine. What's important is that the knees are down and that you're firmly rooted, uh, forming a, a triangle. We suggest that you find your sitting bones. It's the tips of the pelvis. And to do that, if you bend forward and then come up with a slightly rounded back, you should be sitting uh, on these bones. It's essential that the spine be well supported. So by having the pelvis correctly aligned, the spine will be self-supporting. And there'll be no strain and no back, back pain. So once we get the base formed, knees down, sitting bones on the cushion, back very straight. Then we can begin to pay attention to the arms and the hands. We usually rest the hands in the lap in a mudra uh, or gesture. Uh, this, there's many mudras. This particular one is one of unity and calmness, where the hands are palms up, one on top of the other. In the Zen tradition, it's usually left over right. The Tibetans sit right over left. Uh, the thumbs are lightly touching. And the thumbs are just below the navel. In a way, what we're doing here is framing this abdominal area, which we call the hara, which is a wonderful seat of energy. And the arms should be loose and comfortable not stiffly held. No stiffness. The whole body should be soft and easy. We lower the eyes, dropping them to a point about, if you could reach your arm out, about there is where the eyes should, should fall. Three quarters closed. Uh, for many, this seems strange. We're accustomed to praying uh, with closed eyes. This is a practice of experiencing no separation. So we don't want to close off any doors. Everything's open. Ears, eyes, skin, all ways of sensing are alive and open. So I encourage everyone to get used to sitting with the eyes lowered but not shut tight.
And we let the breath drop down to the area where the hands are. And that's perhaps the hardest thing for beginners to get used to is belly breathing. We're always up in our chest. So we're asked to breathe with the abdomen. And our hands are right there. So as the abdomen rises and falls, we can actually uh, verify that for ourselves. The edge of our hand is right there. So as we inhale, we should feel our abdomen pressing slightly on the edge of our hands. And as we exhale, again, everything's shrinking. And we let the breath find its own natural rate. We're not here to control anything and the mind. We invite the mind to join the breath in the abdomen. And we begin practice by becoming our breathing, being one with our breath in the belly. So we're not here to control thoughts or stop thoughts. So we notice that they come and they go. And we pay them no mind. Please, let's sit like Kinhin, or walking meditation, is an opportunity to bring the same quality of attention off of our cushions into our arms and legs. We will walk slowly, close to one another, with each other, letting the breath flow right through the soles of the feet so that with each step we breathe into the earth as Thich Nhat Hanh said, if we could love the earth with each step, we might have a chance to heal this planet. I guess I've been a difficult uh, student throughout my uh, history of uh, spiritual practice because um, Glassman very generously offered me koan study fairly early on in the early years, and I said no. I was always skeptical of things. and. Um, I also had been doing 10 years of um, all this chanting and mantras and visualizations, and I just wanted to sit. So for a long time, my official practice was what we call shikantaza, which is just sitting. Um, and I sat a lot. I sat, I had, uh, at that time was, I had uh, children at home, two kids, and I was um, newly separated and then divorced and working full time. and. Um, not able to run off and, and enter the monastery, which is, I think, what I wanted to do at that point and devote my life to this practice. I was really um, struggling with the balance between my responsibilities as a mother and uh, needing to work, but I sat a lot. I sat at home. I was in the Zendo several times a week in the evenings and on the weekends and found myself... Um, more and more feeling as though I wanted to give my whole life to this practice, that this was what was the most important thing. And what began to shift in those early years as a Zen student was that kind of where my priorities were. I think in the years when I was in, involved in the Tibetan Buddhism, it was a little more of an added thing onto my life. And now it was my life. There was no more sense that there was some my, my involvement with Zen was not something I did like a, a yoga class or a, um, a hobby, you know, that I did to feel relaxed or something. It was my life. And 
what was arising inside was a, um, an almost driving uh, aspiration um, to break through and and be somehow not bound by this self which I began to know so well. Um, and so there in those earl early years was this looking back now it was a kind of a, a rising burning a flame kind of thing that just wouldn't uh, wouldn't out wouldn't go away uh, but rather seemed to increase of, of really aspiring to awaken and to really do it and to not be content or be able to rest. It was not anymore coming from some idea that there was such a thing as waking up, but really coming from sufficient experience to know that it was possible. I think what happens is, you know, the self is like this box that we, um, we, we have these concepts about I, and as we sit, there's, there's holes that are punched, quite literally, in um, in that box and it's like we see the light that's really there that's everywhere and then we use this word enlightenment but it's it's for a reason and our experience of what's beyond the walls of self is very bright and very vast and so first there's these holes punched but once a hole is punched we know for ourselves that there's something else besides just this wall and our whole stance towards practice changes when it's just theoretical and we read that there's something beyond, uh, we're in one place. But the minute we've actually sort of seeing light through holes, our relationship not only to the light but to the walls is very different because we know they're punchable, you know. They're, and we also have a sense that they they get thinner and thinner and thinner. And so it's like the emptiness of the walls um, becomes known to us very personally and experientially, not theoretically, not conceptually. So I think during those years, that's what was happening. There was a, some uh, pretty powerful hole punching happening. And uh, <laughs> I was talking about uh, oatmeal stuck in bowls. I discovered we have this tendency, you know, to put a gilded frame around the hole. I mean, that's how we attach, you know, it's like the medicine bottle. So we get this hole and then we, we gild it and we, we, we decorate it. Oh, look at this, you know, and it's wonderful but we decorate it. So again, so much of practice in those stages was getting rid of all the extra stuff, including this kind of gilding of the frame around the hole in the wall that's really not there, you know. And um, so that kind of process was happening. And I think Sensei, sensei um, certainly um, saw this aspiration as genuine and was very encouraging and very supportive at one point, he uh, no longer asked me if I wanted to do some koan work, but insisted. Uh, I think the way he put it was something like, now it's time to um, now it's time to get rid of the sutures. And I said, what are the sutures? And he said, well, that's for you to find out. And I went home and I thought, you know, when you have an operation, when it's all over, you don't need the stitches anymore. They're unnecessary, they're extra. And so what was the extra threads that were tying me that I didn't need? They didn't have to be there. So he very much at that stage um, wanted me to work with the koan mu. Uh, some of you perhaps know a little bit about this sort of koan work. It's a, a, a question which can't be answered with the conceptual mind. And if one works on a koan, one is asked to bring uh, one's entire being into becoming, uh, becoming the question. So uh, in this case, uh, a monk asked Joshu, good old Joshu, who keeps appearing. It's wonderful wonderful teacher, Joshi. 
uh, a monk asks Joshu, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Joshu answers, boo, which means no, or it's a negative particle. It sounds like a cow, you know. And so a student is asked to become that sound, that boo. And in fully becoming the sound, allowing the entire universe to break open where there's no gap between subject object between I and everything and essentially Mu becomes uh, the cosmos and uh, skeptical Sue of course raised her head once again as I as we're talking I see these threads that run very true and I said oh no I don't want to do this and I really didn't want I thought, how silly. I don't need this. I've had all these wonderful <clears throat> gilded experiences already. Guild noticed the gilding as I speak. I mean, I thought they were pretty good. I've had these experiences. I Usually, Mu is used as an opening koan. I've had my openings. What is this? You know, and I didn't want to do it. And the more I didn't want to do it, the more I heard my wise teacher sort of nodding and saying, you let me know, you know, when we're ready to start and you're going to do this. And of course, you're going to do this and it's time. And and some little, and it was very little part of me, knew that he was absolutely right and knew that if I could finally break through skeptical Sue and all she brought with her, that there was a degree of uh, freedom possible that I simply didn't have now. And so some little part of me said, you know what, you're going to have to do this. Uh, I will honestly say that it was extremely difficult time. Uh, my resistance was very, very strong. And what arose was, I guess, um, my attachment to being a good Zen student. I thought I didn't need this and to have to let go of what I thought of my practice. And I thought I was, I don't know, I have all kinds of pictures of what I was. A kind of very subtle, I guess a kind of arrogance and pride. And all of that had to go. And if we've got some pride, we're very, that's very hard to melt because there's reasons for the pride and we justify it. So I found myself encountering uh, the self you know, which is exactly what it's supposed to, to do. And I would go up for interview, and what happens often is you have to sound this moo out loud with your teacher. And I was far away from my voice. I was out here, and my voice would tentatively say a little moo. Not like that. I mean, I try to do it full voice, but I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. I was self-conscious. I was critical, I was skeptical, I was all these other things, and I certainly wasn't uh, manifesting as the sound of Mu. And it was very painful because Sensei would ring his bell, and I finally decided I was hopeless, and I really hit a real bottom and thought I was just no good at this, and it was all, I was just a failure. And I don't know about everyone else, but I'm real hard on myself. And you know, I was all. Then I would be critical of myself because I was a failure. And there was this layers and layers and layers of negative stuff, self-directed, self-inflicted, self-created. I just went. I just laid it on to the point where I just is gonna just forget it. You know. Um, but I didn't forget it. You know, I kept sitting, and this, again, there was this tiny voice that said, "That's what you're supposed to be seeing, idiot. You're supposed to encounter." This is the self operating. You know, this is your resistance. You know, this is up against the wall, just real tight. And I squirmed and I didn't like it. It was almost like the, you know, the pin and the butterfly kind of feeling that I it had gotten me now and I knew it. But the little part that knew it was very little, but there was that kind of um I don't know, what's the word? Little bit of intuition that knew this was exactly what I needed. So it took altogether about nine months. It was like a gestation. And I guess we started in January. 
and I would say it took till about July when something began to shift. And those early months, that whole winter and early spring, I was um, a total failure as far as I was concerned. But I was still sitting and I was sitting with Moo and I would take my seat and to myself silently, because my children, they already thought I was weird enough, I'm gonna start sounding like a cow, you know? These poor kids, they live through this uh, time. Anyway, I would uh, go upstairs and sit in my room where I had a little altar and everything and uh, the minute I began to sit, my exhalation became a silent moo. And the whole time I'd breathe out was this moo. And I just, my effort at that point was to be that breathing out of that sound. And I remember, I guess it was around June or July, where I went up again every week to go see my teacher. And he heard that I wasn't so far away from that sound. Something had shifted completely. And I remember his saying, oh. And I didn't even know at that point that there'd been this coming, this where Susan somewhere was be, being able to be one with the sound of Moo. I didn't know that. Um, and I remember his sort of welcoming and saying, now, now, now we, you know, now we move, you know. And then the next few months, July, August, September, those next three months were a very different process. No longer blackness, no longer um, I'm no good, but a, a loosening was happening and everything was just loosening. And I would sit and it was, you know, I would cry and shake sometimes and it was embarrassing, but I couldn't help it. But essentially what began to happen was I can only use an analogy. It felt like the house of cards on which Skeptical Sue and the whole structure was built as though the bottom card started to go. And what I experienced those last three months was this kind of slow crumbling of the whole edifice once the bottom cards went. Like something in me just gave up in the resisting. And once that had gone clunk, then the whole thing had to go. And it took its own it had its own life, the dropping. It wasn't all of a sudden everything in one minute. But I began to experience that, oh my goodness, everything's gone. And each time I would sit, I would feel this dissolution. Um, so it was a, uh, a good nine months. And the last um, three, a little scary. But in the end, um, tremendously joy-filled. The strange part being that it seemed like no big deal at all. And it seemed as though I was where I've always been. And it seemed so funny that it had been so difficult to get there. And it really is funny, you know, you just... Uh, how weird us, human, us humans are that we have to go through such a trip to stand on the feet we've always been standing on. Zen by Dayo Kokushi. There is a reality even prior to heaven and earth. Indeed, it has no form, much less a name. Eyes fail to see it. It has no voice for ears to detect. To call it mind or Buddha violates its nature 
for then it becomes like a visionary flower in the air. It is not mind nor Buddha, absolutely quiet and yet illuminating in a mysterious way. It allows itself to be perceived only by the clear-eyed. It is Dharma truly beyond form and sound. It is Tao having nothing to do with words. Wishing to entice the blind, the Buddha has playfully let words escape his golden mouth. Heaven and earth are ever since filled with entangling briars. O oh, my good worthy friends gathered here, if you desire to listen to the thunderous voice of the Dharma, exhaust your words, empty your thoughts, for then you may come to recognize this one essence. of this practice is becoming clear-eyed. The Buddha taught that right from the beginning. Our intrinsic true nature is complete and perfect, but we don't see it. We have a strange topsy-turvy view of our life. Right from the beginning, we are not separated From that reality prior to heaven and earth. This illuminating, mysterious life is not seen, or if glimpses are seen, we see it as something out there. This wonderful Zen practice is about exhausting words and emptying thoughts and coming to be acquainted with what's already present. It's not about creating some new consciousness or a new thing. In a way, what the Buddha taught is that we have it already. We have everything, but we don't dare believe that. And certainly we don't experience that. We need to be clear about these, in a way, two levels we're talking about. The intrinsic, what already exists primordially from the beginning. And experientially, what each of us is able to realize in our life. So even though we say that right from the beginning we are fully awakened and that one with the universe. Most of us haven't yet experienced that. And all of us can continue to deepen our experience of that. This is 
is a practice of waking up, not of acquiring, not of adding on anything. It's quite the opposite. It's a stripping away, dropping off, letting go, opening up. So often people come and ask me, oh, it's so hard to let go of such and such, and I'm so attached. And I realize that that word perhaps misguides us, misleads us. We can't let go in the Zen sense. Things drop off. I can't decide I'm going to let go of a, let's say, a habit I don't find pleasing and I think I ought to let it go. That's not practice. That's just shoving the parts around, which is fine. That's good therapy. But that's not what we're doing here. We're not choosing to let go this and let go that and change ourselves. Something very different happens on the cushion. Things drop off because we see their essential emptiness, their no thingness, and they cease to hold weight. And becoming weightless, they drop. And we may not even know it till we look back and see all the petals, sort of like an old rose, you know, and we see these petals lying at our feet and we say, oh my goodness, that's dropped off. But we're not here with take pruning shears and cut off pieces of our life that we think ought to go. So when we talk about letting go in this sense of Zen practice, please don't misunderstand. Letting go doesn't hurt. It's holding on that hurts. We feel pain because we're stuck. Letting go is joyous and free when things drop off. So how is it that we are not clear-eyed What is the source of our inability to be at one right now? The Buddha taught, and I think all great teachings teach, that it has to do with a concept of our self, this I that's separate from everything that's not I. So as Dogen Zenji said, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by the 10,000 things. Becoming clear-eyed has very much to do with self, sense of self, boundary, melting, disappearing. And most of us, if we're honest, come to some kind of spiritual practice in order to add something to ourself. Um, we like to embroider our life and decorate it, so sometimes I think of a little hat like a little beanie and we come to practice and we put on this little spiritual hat and then we decorate it. Oh, now I do Zen, you know, I do Tai Chi and maybe a little yoga and health foods and macrobiotics and all these good things. And each one we add a little feather. And that's not letting go. That's acquiring.
tiring. I would be offering a disservice if we set up a place here where people came and added yet another decoration. It worries me sometimes, actually, because this place is so beautiful and it's so peaceful and people like it here. And I worry that people come just to feel good, which is how we all begin, but that there'll be a kind of settling into what people get when they come and somehow that won't really give freedom. It will just give a kind of pleasantness. Kazan Zenji wrote over his doorway, anyone who wants to gain enlightenment, don't come in. <laughs> cannot be gained. Cannot be acquired. Becoming clear-eyed, we begin, it almost feels quite literally like this, to see through the walls of the self. There's a kind of transparency that happens. becoming clear-eyed, we also are able to see how the self operates, and that's really important. We're not here just to get kind of list out and all filled with good energy, though that's certainly maybe a small piece of We need to become acquainted with the one who's always controlling everything. And so this clear-eyedness is a practice of noticing, of witnessing, without judgment, completely neutrally, noticing reactions as they arise noticing the pain when we are stuck somewhere. Can we notice without judgment? It's not so easy. The best fuel that I know for this journey is this strong, silent sitting, this exhausting of our thoughts. And being this moment, body, breath, and mind. So this time of working with the Koan Mu was in the fall, September 85 was the kind of culmination of this, this, this crumbling and dissolution that had happened uh, really had unglued something and that my arms and legs didn't feel very strong. I felt, um, I felt rather like a newborn that didn't know yet how to walk and didn't know how to function from the place of what had happened, as though there'd been a, a kind of a new life born, but it wasn't yet um, in my arms and legs. It wasn't, and it was really a jelly feel, jelly-like. That's really exactly how I felt, kind of wobbly. I mean, I was working and I was living my life adequately, 
but I didn't feel at all ready to start teaching or start sharing or doing anything. I just sat a lot. And I had this sense of, of needing to um, needing to sit a lot. It's, it's funny, some people might think after some kind of wonderful breakthrough that one would sort of relax and take it easy, but I felt quite different. I needed very much to allow a kind of percolation into my cells of, of, of what had happened. And that took time. And then the summer of 87, I attended a Buddhist Christian conference in Berkeley and uh, met some wonderful people. And uh, at the end of the conference, I had this quite sudden uh, sense that that the, the, how can I say, it felt like the wing drying period was over. You know, the chrysalis had broken, or the cocoon, a while back, and there'd been this time of sort of waiting on the branch until the wings were dry or the arms and legs were strong. And I suddenly, I don't know why, really, uh, knew that I could walk or fly or whatever analogy we're using. And I called Glassman from California, which was not my style at all. I never called him on the phone and bothered, you know, I didn't intrude in his life. I, I was his student, not, you know, somebody who picked up the phone and called him. But I called him from California and I said, something has happened. I don't know what it means. I said, I suddenly can, can move. And, you know, he said, that's wonderful. And, and within a month, I was in my car driving to Cambridge, Massachusetts and beginning to sit with Maureen Stewart Roshi. And it was very strange. I didn't intend to leave um, Glassman Sensei. I, what I really intended to do was to connect with Maureen. And that connection very quickly was such a powerful one that I couldn't have my feet in two boats. So in fact, I did leave. But I left uh, really to go on. And I think uh, Glassman Sensei realized that and really gave me all his encouragement to, I remember as he said, the Dharma wheel does turn us, doesn't it? And it was this feeling of being turned and being, um, well, being led is a funny word, but uh, I would say being, being pulled to now uh, spend some time with Maureen. And thank goodness I did because she only lived about two and a half years after that. She, she died cancer in uh, a year ago. So we didn't have much time together. What I learned from her was the next step of practice, which we call actualizing. And it had to do with the arms and legs being strong enough to walk. And it had to do with the kind of true confidence in what had happened and being able to express that. And Maureen was very, um, I say she, she, she embodied her practice in a way that I've never encountered. She walked and breathed and spoke with complete at one minute with her in the moment. To walk kinhin with Maureen was a teaching. She didn't have to tell me anything in the Dokusan room. That's not where I learned from her. I learned from her walking in kinhin, sitting in the Zendo, having tea together. She simply radiated her being was was so, uh, uh, what's the word? She just embodied her practice so fully and with such life that somehow, and she was so completely herself. It was her Maureenness which kind of gave me, helped me get how to be Susan. And it's interesting as we talk about the self dropping, and that's true, but at the same time, it's only this one, this person, who can go forward. And so this one is the only one who can embody and manifest the enlightened way, so to speak. You know, it's not, it's not through anything else. It's these arms and legs. And this personality, even with all its flaws and its habits and its quirks and its hang-ups and neurotic things, and we all have them, this one, this is it, you know? And somehow I got that by being around her because she took all that she was, including her quirks and her difficulties, and, and she was a strong, stubborn, Scottish, Canadian woman, you know, and had her things which was difficult. But that whole, that whole person embodied the way. And she made use of all that she was. And it was a powerful teaching how to, 
how to be Susan and, and let and let this one and I'm not like her at all I'm not her like I'm not her clone I couldn't model myself my personalities are so different which was painful I think for both of us because she didn't quite understand me sometimes I didn't quite understand her because we're really different uh, but somewhere I she gave me the, the courage to let let this one give expression to the Dharma and she really encouraged me to go forth and, and you know give talks and meet with people and uh, take care of his endo and things really tightened up she also insisted or offered but really insisted on ordaining me and I had decided at that person finally after at that point after a long journey to stay a lay person and she said no 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 you know that she wanted to be sure that I was empowered to really transmit this teaching fully and you know um, be able to take care of a zendo and so she wanted to give me tokodo and so she did and she did it in Rye at the meeting house which was a very joyous occasion she was told me about her cancer the day of my ordination so the whole last year and a half uh, of her life after I was ordained was uh, sitting with the fact that we didn't have much time and she was rather tough in her determination that I not cling to her and not become dependent. So for most of the time that I was her student, she was literally pushing me out of the nest and not allowing um, either emotional dependency or any other kind, but really um, really insisting that I discover for myself uh, what I can do. There was no leaning on her. She didn't allow it. And um, I'm very grateful for that. I guess I'm kind of an oddball. You know, I'm um, a Zen monk or a Zen priest, but I uh, go to work every day in a nursing home. I actually work in a Jewish nursing home, which even adds an extra religion. I now can uh, sing the Shabbat songs with uh, perfect Hebrew pronunciation. And um, I'm a mother and, you know, very much in the world. And, um, and I, I'm a Zen priest and a Zen monk and I wear robes and I take care of a Zendo. Um, I'm also an associate at an Episcopal convent, the convent of St. Helena. And I will spend Easter up there with the sisters, and I love it there. And I guess um, I just want to share that it was after um, 15 years of rather intense Buddhist practice of meditation. Uh, and after my work with the koan, and after I had reached a point of uh, dissolution of much that had bound me, um, and it was then that I somehow found my feet taking me into a church. It was an Episcopal church quite by accident. There was no intention to go to that denomination. It's just where I went. And um, it was there that um, I reconnected with Christianity in a way that was uh, quite, quite powerful. Looking back, I would describe it as an ignition of the heart. And I thought at the time maybe this meant that I would leave um, my Zen life. And I, the next day, went back in the Zendo with the question, uh, what should I do? And almost words came, you know, keep sitting. You know, sit here with Christ, whatever, however we understand that. And so that's what I've been doing. 
uh, honoring outwardly in a small way by participating in this convent, uh, going up there when I can, uh, but inwardly acknowledging the the really burning truth um, that's come through the love and the healing um, of Christ and not um, in any way feeling that my Zen practice um, contradicts that. Uh, I'm sort of a, an oddball and a kind of a bridge person. Um, it's like um, two lineages. In, in Buddhism, we talk about a lineage or a line of transmission. And I think of it sometimes like intravenous, you know, like I've got two IVs going. And they mix in the heart. And the mixture is full and alive. And um, I don't know exactly what's ahead. But at the very least, I hope that those who have strong Christian faith are not afraid to practice Zen. I feel it will enrich and enliven faith and not contradict it or threaten it. Uh, sadly, many people who come to practice today have no faith. And I see that. Western traditions have, have lost. Um, and people just don't, aren't involved in their religions anymore. Um, in any case, it's, um, it's most interesting being on a bridge, being a bridge, and we'll see how it, how it turns out.